in politics, you need to learn to be suspicious of ready-made meanings. When something is presented to you as having a prefabricated package set of meanings, not of your own creation. Look at a map. Look at the Gaza Strip. Look at the West Bank. Now look at the Golan Heights. What are these three places? These three places that immediately and self-evidently, at a glance on a map, <laughs> they're discontinuous. Each of the three clearly has its own peculiar history of how it came to have a dotted line around it on that map. Let's put it like that. Oh, these three places, you are told, you are told they're one and the same. There's supposedly one place that's called Palestine. And the people living there supposedly are Palestinians. It's a ready-made meaning, right? What you've got to learn to do in politics is look at the seams of these ideas. Look at the, look at the lines where the garment is stitched together and think about how it's made and in your mind's eye to pull it apart into its constituent parts. Now, once you accept the assumption that the people living in the Golan Heights today, that they are Palestinians. There's a whole lot of other ideas built into that ready-made meaning. In the English language, whether you are left, right, or center, wherever you are in the political spectrum, Palestinian implicitly means indigenous. That these were the indigenous people who were there paradoxically before the Jews. <laughs> no, no need, no need to examine or analyze this claim already. All right, this is a complex paradoxical assumption, right? That they are the conquered people rather than the conquerors, right? That they are a sort of endangered species being encroached upon on all sides. By the Jews, again, despite kind of what you can see on the map. <laughs> but these deeply paradoxical notions are all packaged into the idea of Palestinian. Okay, What is the Golan Heights? Where is the Golan Heights? Who are the people living and working today in the Golan Heights? The Golan Heights is the former territory of Syria. The people who were living there were Syrian citizens right up until the minute Israel conquered that territory. And the reason why there's a dotted line around it on the map is that Israel doesn't really want to keep that territory. They don't really want to make those people into Israeli citizens. Israel assumed, and we'll get into this assumption, and it's quite appropriate to say Israel, by the way, rather than any particular government in Israel or any particular political persuasion in Israel. Say, Israel assumed that they would conquer this small piece of territory and then that they would return it to Syria in subsequent negotiations for whatever reason, newspapers always refer to this as a land for peace deal. I think that's a little bit of a misleading term. By the end of this video, you're going to understand all this in adequate depth. And I think there is such a thing as adequate depth. I think you can know enough about this conflict without becoming a specialist, without devoting your life to it, without becoming an expert. The problem is precisely overcoming these, these ready-made notions, these, these stereotypes. Now, let's take a step back here. 2023, we're heading into 
the darkest period of the Israel-Palestine conflict in its entire history. The Israeli side has made itself despicable to the whole Western world. It has made itself despicable, not just to like left-wing intellectuals within Israel, leftists, moderates, even conservative and right-wing atheists, right? They matter. You know, you could be conservative or even a little bit to the right, but you're not a religious maniac. You're either an outright atheist, just a very secular, modern cosmopolitan person. There's a huge range of opinion, both within Israel and around the world. Right now, as never before, the government of Israel has made itself despicable to the people whose support matters most, right? Including people in a little country you might never have heard of before called the United States of America, right? Israel has just now, just recently, has alienated all of its sources of support. Now, on the other side, on, on the Palestinian side, I mean, you know, it's, it's really, it's this incredibly complex map of the world. I mean, to talk about there being just one other side is kind of ridiculous. Like, you think Dubai doesn't matter? You think Saudi Arabia doesn't matter? You think Iran doesn't matter? Like, there are a lot of different sides here that, that matter, right? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Anyone in the audience who is over 40 years old remembers Yasser Arafat, right? Now, like, at the time... Nobody thought Yasser Arafat was a genius. Nobody thought he was a great statesman. Nobody thought he was a good politician. Everybody thought he was corrupt. Everyone thought he was guilty of kind of stupid, self-indulgent, short-term thinking and power mongering and kind of corrupt gangster politics in Palestine. All right. Nobody thought we'd be in a position, you know, going ahead decades in the year 2023 to look back on the leadership of Yasser Arafat as like a, a golden age when the Palestinians had somebody to represent them at international events. And that, like, I can't really say Yasser Arafat was respectable, right? But today, like, compared to what? Who is the respectable face for the Palestinians today? Who shows up to represent? Like, Hamas. <laughs> oh, yeah, Hamas and Hezbollah. A whole bunch of guys, none of whom have the perceived legitimacy of Yasser Arafat, right? Neither within Palestine, nor within Israel, nor within the Middle East broadly, nor for the whole world, right? There's nobody who can fly to Washington, D.C. and speak on behalf of the Palestinians today the way Yasser Arafat once could. So this is a little bit more subtle. The sense in which the government of Israel has become despicable and loathsome, it's obvious, and it's talked about openly in the press, in large part because the, the process that produced this despicable government in Israel is democratic. They had elections. I'll talk a little bit more about that. They elected the people who are now in power. And this is a sudden drastic change in the politics of Israel from the outside perspective. I'll, I'll say what I mean by that too, a sudden drastic change. With the Palestinian side, it's not a sudden drastic change, right? Since the death of Yasser Arafat, it's just been a long, slow, gradual, hopeless situation in which nobody has any political legitimacy whatsoever. And I know this may sound strange to say, but let's let's be real. Nobody has democratic political legitimacy. Also, nobody has like undemocratic political legitimacy. Now, what do I mean by undemocratic? Sometimes there's somebody who's like a uh, crown prince. It's a member of the royal family. Someone, their, their legitimacy is not democratic at all, but they are really respected, maybe just within the country, maybe in the region, as the, as the important leader, right? They, they have nothing like that. Sometimes there's a religious leader. And I just want to point out, that's even happened in modern Greece, modern Cyprus. Sometimes there's a charismatic priest or something, right? Obviously with Islam, we don't use the word priest, but same thing. Sometimes there's somebody... Their rise to power is not democratic in any way, but nevertheless, they can play the role of somebody like a Yasser Arafat. They can show up in negotiations and 
uh, their significance, the, the, the extent to which their voice matters, nobody is going to question, even though it's not democratic. Okay. So it's in this sense, I say, we are now heading into the bleakest, the blackest period of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. In precisely the sense, it has never been this bad ever before. Now, I think you can add to that. I don't really want to. Uh, I don't really want to get into the politics of Syria in this video. I don't really want to get into politics of Egypt in this video. I don't really want to get into the politics of Turkey in this video. Um, and I don't want to get into politics of like Libya and North Africa, like that that part northeastern Africa. But if you think about it, you know, um, obviously. This is also a, a uniquely dark, dangerous, terrifying period in the politics of Turkey. Does anyone in my audience want to dispute that with me? Does anyone want to say, no, this is a wonderful, optimistic period in the history of democracy in Turkey? No. I think it's also a terrifyingly dark and hopeless period in Syria, in Egypt, in places like Libya and, and North Africa. Oh, oh, hey, guys, remember the Arab Spring? Remember that? <laughs> Here we are. Here we are in the ashes, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. What are we going to call this? The Arab Winter? The Endless Arab Winter? The Arab Igloo? I coined the fucking term, guys. Make it happen. This is the era of the Arab Igloo that came after the Arab Spring. Because it's a deep freeze we're all huddled in that ain't going to end. So hashtag Arab Igloo. Go on. Make it happen. So yeah, I'll just say, if you take a step back, you know, what do you want me to say about Iran? What do you want me to say about Iraq? What do you want me to say about the relationship between the United States of America and Saudi Arabia? How that started to change with the election of Trump and then changed way more once Joe Biden was elected. Joe Biden, first president ever, comes into office day one, says it's over between the United States and Saudi Arabia. The strategic alliance, the special relationship is over. Day one, decisive move from Joe Biden. Also, day one from Joe Biden, far more anti-China than Donald Trump. What happens? Today, China is in an overt four-way alliance, right? China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. The most cynical alliance in the history of planet Earth. That impacts Israel. Iran is in no fertile alliance China. Oh, hey, sorry, I, I know this is a little bit further on the map, but not that much further. Pakistan. Oh, um, does anyone here want to dispute with me? I just said this about Turkey. Do any of you guys feel this is a bright and optimistic period in the history of democracy in Pakistan? Do you know what just fucking happened under Joe Biden in terms of the United States, its relation to China, its relation to India, its relation to Pakistan. Again, most of you guys don't know this kind of shit. Well, I do. Okay? So, yeah, this is an incredibly dark period within Israeli politics, within the region, right? And then in terms of how the whole world relates to the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm going to say this about 10 times in this fucking video, all right? Every monotheistic religion is an apocalyptic death cult. Some of you watching this video are 17 years old, and it's hard for you to accept that. And some of you watching this video are 60 years old, and it's still hard for you to accept that. You want to believe that what the church is about is baking brownies and brotherhood and helping poor people in wheelchairs. I get it. That is what you want to believe. Conservatism. It's a perfectly paradoxical name for a political ideology. The quintessence of conservatism is a yearning for the world to end. What it means 
to be a conservative, whether you are a conservative Christian, a conservative Muslim, a conservative Jew, is that you wake up every fucking day and think this world has gone wrong. Whether you think that that's every day since Adam and Eve bit into that fucking apple, or whether you think of the timeline of the world in terms of, you know, some other magical event like the death of Jesus Christ, the life and death of the Prophet Muhammad, there's some point after which you think humanity is in a fallen state. This world is so evil that you can't wait for it to end. The most authentic expression of conservatism is accelerationism, which is to say attempts to hasten the end of the world. Looking forward positively to the return of the Messiah, or if you're Jewish, the first appearance of the Messiah, looking forward positively to Ragnarok, Judgment Day, the apocalypse, whatever the fuck you want to say. At its heart, that's what conservatism is. Conservatives are people who want to see the world burn. They're people who embrace the judgment of God that this world is not good enough. It can never be good enough. You can never be good enough because they feel human nature is bad. It's loathsome, it's evil, and it's wrong. They're disgusted with their own bodies. They're disgusted with their own desires. It's not just homosexuality they're disgusted by. They're disgusted by heterosexuality. It's not just war they're disgusted by. It's peace they're disgusted by. They're disgusted by vanity. And you can already see this in the prophets of the Old Testament. Once you start to look around with this mentality, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. They despise life. That is what it is to be a conservative. It is an apocalyptic death cult. Israeli democracy is doomed today because of what was taught in Israeli schools around the years 1975 to 1985, right? The people who matter in politics today, some of them are older. We can go back to 1965 if you like. But let's just say what was taught in schools in Israel between about 1975 and 1985. All the conservatives, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, they're all complete hypocrites on this issue because they can see the problem when they look at another religion, but they can't see the problem when they look at their own religion, right? Like if you talk to a conservative Jew, I mean, once again, we could say this again with a conservative Christian. You say, oh man, you know, um, I've been living in Utah and you know, it's so sad. I meet these people in Utah they went to a Mormon primary school. They went to a Mormon high school. They went to a Mormon university. What do you think their view of the world is? Politically, what do you think is possible for these people, right? Think about their whole outlook. Oh, yeah, that's so sad. Oh, yeah, I can see what's wrong with that. Okay, talk to a Christian about the Muslim madrasas. Say, Look at these kids raised going to a fucking Muslim address. They go to a Muslim primary school, they go to a Muslim high school, they go to a Muslim university, like the Muslim kindergarten. They're going through this madrasa system. They're getting this stuff, you know, rehearsed and memorized in their head. This is their upbringing. You know, what do you think is going to happen? Like politically, what's possible? How can we have democracy? How can we have progress? How can we even have science? What, it, what do you think their attitude is going to be towards evolution? And a conservative Christian can look at the Muslims and go, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's bad, right? 
They can't look at their own schools and see what's wrong with it. They can't look at their own schools and see how fucked up and evil this is. They can't look at their own schools and think, if this is what children are being taught today, what is going to happen in the world 30 years from now? Now, I'll just say, both the left and the right are very comfortable with talking about politics being in a reciprocal relationship with economics. They're comfortable with that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, the price of gasoline is up and unemployment is down and wages and the stock market and the economy. Whether you're left or right, you're real comfortable talking about economics and how that relates to what's going on in politics. Nobody is comfortable talking about education in relation to what's going on in politics. All right? Just want to say this real briefly. The Israeli economy is fucking phenomenal. I've done the research on the economy of Israel. You would not believe what an amazing economy this country has. In the midst of war, in the midst of the desert, they have all these disadvantages. All right? It's an unbelievably successful country economically. They have really put the pieces together. And then on top of that, they've got offshore oil money that's just starting to come in. So you have this amazing economy in every respect. Like, guys, it's not just one thing they're good at. It's like you go through this economy sector by sector. It's mind-blowing what a great economy Israel has. And then you know, oh, wow, and now they're going to get oil money, which they didn't have before. They got these platforms that are just starting to pump oil. Okay, they got some offshore oil money. Uh, you know, by the way, uh, so does um, the island of Cyprus. It's not far from Israel. Just say there's some oil there in that, that part of the ocean. Okay, so <laughs> this is kind of about the banality of economics. If you think economic success means political success or economic optimism equates to political optimism. No. Israel is an unbelievably hopeless, heartbreaking country to examine, to analyze because of the relationship between education and politics. Um, yeah, so funny comment from Gen X Gamer. Shout out to Gen X Gamer. Thanks for being here in the crowd. Uh, well, you know, um, he knew someone in Utah who believed that the people who built the pyramids were white. Just lately on this channel, I've also had quite a lot of hate mail from people who believe that the the, the, the Egyptians who built the pyramids were black, that they were sub-Saharan black Africans. So it seems like a lot of people look at the history of Egypt and want to write themselves into that uh, that history for whatever for whatever reason. Um I guess it's just the sort of unearned ego trip. I, you know, I guess it's envy. I mean, it must be tough to look at your own country's history and think we never built the pyramids. We in all these same in all the same centuries, the same number of centuries, in all these centuries, we never accomplished anything great. I don't know. I mean, you know, if you talk to people from Scotland, did they have pyramid envy? Are they sitting there in Scotland thinking all we ever built was Hadrian's Wall? You know. <laughs> Anyway, thanks. Nice, uh, nice digression. Um, in the same sense that you can examine people who went to primary school with the Mormons, high school with Mormons, university Mormons, they lived their whole life inside the church that way. Okay, what if we do a major social science research project looking at the diversity of political views amongst Mormons who had that background, then who stayed in the church themselves, they didn't rebel against didn't leave, and they had their own children and put their own children in the same system. How much diversity of political view do you think you're going to get? You know, there are millions of them. We could do social science research. I think nobody will want to do that research. It's so boring. Say so right away, yeah, generally all these people think the same. You know, you could get into the details of exactly what their political views. Of course, there's going to be some disagreement about some issues amongst them. But to a remarkable extent, 
that educational background, that religious background, and by the way, in an unexamined sense, also that linguistic background predestines those people to their political fate. And when you scale it up, it predestines your whole society to that political fate. Can you rebel against the programming you've received in your education, in your you know, religion? Uh, can you rebel against the programming that's even in the language you happen to be born speaking? Yes, you can. You are one of the viewers of a If you're watching this video, you're probably one of the people who's read my book, No More Manifestos, or my other book, Future of an Illusion. You're part of a minority within a minority within a minority who can think for yourself and who can do the work, right? The vast majority of people never will. The vast majority of people won't question and won't rebel against that kind of cultural programming. Or if they do, their acts of rebellion will be purely self-destructive, right? Like they think they're rebelling against it by joining a rock and roll band and becoming a cocaine addict or by sneaking away and going to a strip club, you know, one, once a month or something, you know, their acts of rebellion against orthodoxy, right? They, they, they do nothing positive for themselves as an individual. They do nothing positive for society scaling up politically. So, you know, there are people who in that sense rebel against their programming, but that rebellion, you know, in a sense, it's a disgrace um, to the word rebellion as such. Um, the West Bank. What is the West Bank west of? Why is it called the West Bank? There's, there's a ready-made answer here, and it's wrong. Now, the main reason I'm making this video, I received one question from one viewer in the audience, and he's a guy who is Israeli, and he's trying to escape from Israel. So you got to come back to that. Remind me. you got to talk about the, the, the people who are Israeli citizens and are trying to flee Israel and find a new life elsewhere. i got to talk about that. So maybe I'll remind myself. Maybe I'll just remind me. Okay. I got one email from one viewer of the channel who's in Israel, and he was asking me, do I describe myself as a Zionist? Or an anti-Zionist. And you know, so that, that was a while ago. It was more than a couple of weeks ago. So that. Maybe a couple months ago. But whatever. Over so many weeks, I thought, you know what? That question is actually too boring for me to make a video about. But then I thought, what if the question is instead for you in the audience? How should you describe yourself? How should you talk about Israel and Zionism and anti-Zionism? And that's more interesting. And that's more challenging. That's what I'm trying to articulate to you. That's what I'm trying to teach you is how you can deal with these issues. And I understand that people, left, right, and center, they very quickly become angry about this issue. They very quickly become violent about this issue. I have seen members of my own family physically fighting each other, like just around the dinner table over this issue, right? Like people punch each other out at Thanksgiving dinner over this shit, all right? Tempers run real hot, real quick. And again, even on the left, you deal with tremendous racism around this issue. I made a video talking about that quite recently. I think the live stream immediately before this one, I really talk about how that left wing racism works. Obviously, in the right wing, there's a different kind of racism and anti-Semitism that's prevalent. But So, you know, and again, <laughs> all monotheism, every monotheistic religion is an apocalyptic death cult. And the land of Israel, the place is uniquely and powerfully linked to that impending apocalypse, that coming redemption in death that all of them are ideologically committed to, that all of them dream about or have nightmares about and are obsessed with. Now, I said earlier, the purest expression of this is accelerationism. At its core, conservatism is apocalyptic accelerationism. There is a group, you can Google this. I, I'm just being honest with you, I don't even know. I don't know if the Wikipedia article covers this. There's a group called SIL, the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Now, I'm just being honest, I haven't looked at the Wikipedia article. 
most people, when they talk about the politics of SIL, they immediately want to talk about the CIA. They want to talk about U.S. foreign policy and this shit. It's not the real story. It's kind of a sideshow. People want to blame everything on the CIA. It's, it's really unfair. The CIA gets a bad reputation, you know. Um, you know, th there are some anecdotes. Don't get me wrong. There are some things that link SIL to the CIA. It's not that there's smoke with no fire, but that's not the story that's really worth thinking about here. Um, <coughs> SIL, the Summer in Student Linguistics, was founded to serve a particular accelerationist philosophy that goes as, as follows. They believe that it would be unfair for God to end the world and bring in the apocalypse, whatever you want to say. Um, it would be unfair if God did that before the gospel were translated into every language in the world and every people in the world had the opportunity to hear the gospel and either accept it and reject it. Now, this is not based on anything Jesus said. <laughs> it's not based on anything Moses said. But, you know, I think you can see how that reading of the Bible and just a, a sense of fair play, like, well, it doesn't make sense, like, for everybody in Tibet to be killed and sent to hell if the Bible isn't translated into Tibetan. Right, and then you start getting into a list of more and more obscure languages. Oh, here are these indigenous people in Papua New Guinea. Here are these indigenous people living in a remote part of the jungle in Brazil, and the Bible hasn't been translated into their language. And you can see right away, as soon as they created this ideology, money starts flowing in. A lot of rich people are going to donate money to that project. Where you say, "Hey guys." We're going to translate the Bible into Tibetan. We're going to translate the Bible into a bunch of languages you can't pronounce and you've never heard of. And we're going to take the gospel and we're going to bring it to these people. And for the donors, the people donating money, it may or may not matter to them that your reason for doing this is that you want the world to end as soon as possible, that you are literally trying to hasten the apocalypse because you think that Judgment Day won't come until this process of translation and preaching and proselytizing has reached every corner of the world, has reached every tribe in the world. That's their philosophy. Okay? Now, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> I, I can tell you that this is insane. In a sense, it's insane. But in a sense, it's perfectly rational. That is the heart, the beating heart of conservatism. And I want to say this to you straight up, whether you are a heterosexual male or a heterosexual female, the agony that the conservative character type lives with, it's sexy. It's attractive. It's got a kind of magnetism to it. You know, um, <laughs> when you meet someone who really is that fire and brimstone character. You know, and again, even the late the prophets in the Old Testament, toward the end of the Old Testament, really have that character. This is not something you only find in Christianity or only find in Islam. When you meet someone who is living to die, someone who's really fucking down to die for their principles, no matter what, how fucking insane or stupid their principles are, you meet someone who says, to me, all flesh is grass. To me, this world ain't shit. You know, people who really fucking have discarded this planet as a veil of tears. It's sexy. It's charismatic. It's powerful. I'll say this very simply. It's not depressing or depressive, right? It, it's got a very kind of world-conquering vibe to it, even though it's a world-destroying, you know, ultimately self-abnegating, self-hating. We say world-weary, but it's a world-hating vibe. The vibe is that you don't want this life, you don't want this planet, and you just want it to end as soon as possible. But again, that type of preacher, 
that type of character, it actually in practice, it's very sexy. It's very charismatic. It's very appealing to people. I don't know how gay people and lesbian people feel about it, to be honest with you. That's why I said heterosexual. Um, you know, I've met conservative religious women and they're not beautiful to me or they're not particularly beautiful. Uh, and they're not intelligent enough for me. They're really, <laughs> they're really not intellectually developed enough for me. But just the way they live with that agony and that, that sense of the ethical seriousness of their own life in contrast to the triviality of the things of this world, right? It's very sexy. It's very appealing. Okay? Let's give you some real-world contrast. Over here is a bitch who cares about shoes. You want to talk to me about designer shoes, bitch? Over here is a bitch who cares about a gold necklace. You want to talk to me about a gold necklace, bitch? Over here is a bitch who is a member of an apocalyptic death cult. It's incredibly fucked up. It's incredibly evil. But one of the reasons why it's been so popular and so common on our whole fucking planet for more than 2,000 years, right, is that it's, it seems profound. It seems powerful. It seems sexy. It seems to give this person some kind of leadership qualities that a relatively shallow and vain person who is enjoying their life doesn't have, right? And like, guys, you know, like there's the sense in which we all have to take a step back and challenge ourselves. Out of these two women, I mean, they're, they're caricatures, you know, is it, is it really so bad that this woman wants to own designer shoes? Is it really so bad that she wants to own a gold necklace? Is it really so bad that she wants to enjoy this life and a large part of her enjoyment of this life and what this world has to offer is vanity, vanity, vanities? You know, you got to kind of challenge your own bias or perspective here. And on the other hand, this other woman, you know, there's the sort of veneer of profundity. There's the veneer of gravitas and seriousness about her ideology. But what does she actually believe? She believes that, you know, like the most important thing in the world is to cut off part of the penis of her own child to make a covenant with this magical God um, because this God made a deal with Abraham that you cut off part of your penis. It's, it's barbaric. It's stupid. It's despicable. It's absolutely worse than caring about designer shoes or gold necklaces, right? But I do think there's like a sense in which we... Uh, we even instinctually react to this as having a certain kind of gravitas and people are drawn to it and people become followers of not the preacher who says, Hey, love your neighbor and all this shit. I think there's a reason why within all these traditions, very often, very often, or perhaps always the most powerful message, right? The atom bomb of the monotheistic ideological arsenal is the world is going to end. Judgment Day is coming. You know, that's that's really the linchpin of their ideology. It matters more than heaven or hell. It matters more than the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it puts the timeline of your life in perspective. It puts the meaning of life for the whole history of the world in perspective. Judgment Day is coming. And therefore... Do you really give a fuck about these designer shoes? Do you really give a fuck about this gold necklace? Right, that's the vibe. All right. Um, so look again, and you could switch the genders around. If you are a heterosexual woman, do you really respond positively to a, a heterosexual man who is who is vain, vain and petty, and enjoying the petty things of this world, as opposed to that seeming profundity of that monotheistic apocalyptic uh, worldview? Now, in every country, um, left, right, and center, we have a tendency to despise the rich as if they are social parasites. All right? It's a big problem in politics and economics of our, of our time. Now, I've argued, even in my, my own book, uh, No More Manifestos, 
how how misleading this is, whether we're looking at the history of prior centuries or the current and ongoing history of, of this century, you have to really look at who the rich are, who the ruling class are, and what they do in a much more sophisticated way. Um, okay. Part of the definition of being wealthy, well, let's just say in brief, of being a multimillionaire, part of the definition is that you can move anywhere in the world, right? In the 21st century, if you are a multimillionaire, if you are truly wealthy, right, you can move anywhere in the world. Right now, if you are a left of center Israeli, moderate left, over to far left, the whole range, if you are a secular atheist Israeli who has several million dollars to your name, what are you going to do? You're going to flee Israel. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that just started happening the day before yesterday. It didn't just start happening with the most recent elections that put Benjamin Netanyahu back in power, blah, 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 right? Obviously, there has been some long-term pressure on Israel this way. Um, I've met Israelis all around the world who fled Israel. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think any of the ones I talked to were multimillionaires. I think they were middle-class people or some of them even poor. But, you know, there have been some attempts to survey these Israelis who leave Israel. And keep in mind, a lot of them still have the passport. They still have the citizenship. But they've like they may not have actually become a citizen of another country, but they're living somewhere else. Again, if you're a multimillionaire, you don't have to become a citizen of the United States to live most of your time in California or most of your time in Florida. You can make it happen. You can cross borders, you know, what have you. Again, when I was in Thailand, I met all these white people who are multimillionaires and they live in Thailand, but they are not citizens of Thailand. If you are a multimillionaire, you have a lot of options. You can work something out with the paperwork. You can get one. You can get one kind of visa or another, whether that's an investment visa or a retirement visa or long-term vacation visa. You can make it happen to live somewhere else in the world. Um, it's always been striking to me that when you look at the attempts to survey and interview these Israelis who've left Israel to live elsewhere overseas, they say they feel more comfortable in Berlin than in Israel. They say they feel more comfortable in Moscow than in Israel. Now, it's it's not surprising to me that they say they feel more comfortable in New York, Los Angeles, I don't know, Florida. Like, you know, like <laughs> it would not surprise me if you talk to some Israelis and they say they're happier living in uh, Hawaii. I met Israelis who were happier living in Taiwan than Israel. Met Israelis who were happier living in communist China. In Israel. I've met Israelis all over the world who are escaping from Israel. And by the way, they're not all atheists, right? Some of them may just be people who have a modern, detached attitude towards religion. Like they don't consider themselves atheists, but they think that God is just a kind of metaphor. God is just an abstract concept, you know, whatever you want to say. They don't, they don't believe in a, a God in the sort of um, I don't know, 12th century sense of the term, you know, uh, whatever it is they believe in is not what, uh, anyway, they don't believe there's a God who answers their prayers and talks to them at night or this, this kind of thing. But, you know, whether they are kind of moderate, modern religious people or outright atheists, whether they're centrists or all the way over to the far left, these people are leaving Israel. What is the effect of that cumulatively over time for the politics of Israel? We all know the wealthy multimillionaire class is far more politically influential than the voiceless poor. Whether or not that should be the case, it's not what we're discussing here. What, what is the ideal arrangement of a society so that the poor can have a voice in government? How should, in theory or in principle, how should democracy operate? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a different YouTube video, okay? In the real world, here and now, today, right? In the United States of America, for example, you have cash and carry democracy. Those with the most money have the most voice, have the most power, have the most influence, with very few exceptions. Right? Okay. The United States of America has had a long period of time in which their democratic system has appeared to function far better than it actually does 
because the whole country has been on the edge of a 50-50 split in the House of Congress and a 50-50 split in the Senate, right? So within my lifetime, right, the, the division of Republican versus Democrat, they've been fighting back and forth right at this 50-50 point most, most of the time in my life, right? I don't know if you guys know this. One of the things people say about Barack Obama was that he had a super majority, but that he squandered it. And then you actually look into the details of that period of time. And actually the division between Democrat and Republican during that time, I think it's Barack Obama's first term of office, it's so close to 50-50 that it's like, no, the problem is at this time, there was one guy in the Senate and two guys in the House of Representatives like, who had heart attacks and were in the hospital, right? They're not dead, but they can't actually come to vote. Like if they're dead, someone else replaces them, but they're not dead. They're, you know, the actual like illness and hospitalization of a few members of Congress and the Senate, and a lot of these guys are elderly and none of them are vegan, you know, that that was decisive. It was like, oh, no, no. Like, even though in theory on paper, the Democrats had a supermajority, at that time, this guy was in the hospital and this other guy was, you know, whatever the situation was, you have to go through the list person by person, seat by seat to see how many votes were actually there to be counted. You're, you're so close to a 50-50 split, all right? It, it, the American system, uh, and by the way, my book is not only about this, but a significant portion of my book uh, no more manifestos. It really does explain to you why the American system of government is the way it is. You know why? Why in some ways it works, and in, and in some ways it doesn't. You can put it like that. And you know, it comes down to fascinating and forgotten figures like this: the man who really wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, uh, Governor Morris. You know, so uh, this video I'm making today is trying to enlighten you and deprogram you from the propaganda about Israel, Israel and Palestine. But my book, No More Manifestos, it will really help you to understand what democracy is in the United States of America, how it got to be that way, and it'll help you understand what democracy is in Western Europe and how it got to be that way also. So just say, get, get into that in that, uh, in that book. Okay. During my lifetime, right, the same period of time, I'm in my mid-40s, what if the whole time one political party or another had just 60% of the seats in both the Senate and the House of Representatives? What if they had 60% of the seats in government? Then the United States would have no democracy at all, right? Like, really, there's, there's only a limited amount of democracy in the United States. America. It's more than zero. They have some. They have some democracy, Right? But it has operated in the way that it did for 40 years, right? We've had the benefits of a very close, a very closely, intensely contested elections again and again. Because most of the time, we've been right on that line of a 50-50 split uh, in the Senate, uh, in the House of Representatives. And even with the elections of presidents, most of the time, those elections have been close enough that right up to the last few weeks, nobody knows who's going to win. All right. A lot of democracy in the world are not like that. And a lot of democracy in the world, you go for decades where everybody knows who's going to win the election because more than 60% of people are going to vote for one particular party. Sometimes it's more than 70%, sometimes it's more than 80%. But where you know you have a long period of time of stasis, right? And what I'm saying to you is, although there are some things about the American system that are good, I mean, definitely, for example, there are, there are many aspects of the American system that are better than the Canadian system, to use a direct comparison. Canada has a really terrible system of democracy. Uh, but my point is, American democracy will fall apart even if we go to a long period of one political party or another representing 60% of the seats. And note that I'm saying 60% of the seats, not 60% of the population, because those are two different things. Israel today is in the incipient stages of a long, bleak, hopeless period in which the religious right wing is going to have 60% of political power. And in their system, having 60% is a lot like having 100%, right? That's true with many British-style parliamentary democracies. 
around the world. A lot of time, if you got 60% of the seats, you got 100% of the power. There's no, nothing else is, is going to happen. And what I'm saying to you is, just we're just talking about within Israel at this moment, not getting into Palestine, Iran, Iraq, Turkey. But if you look at Israel's democracy in and of itself, this um, disequilibrium, this preponderance of power in the hands of the religious right wing, it is only going to get worse and worse and worse. Because of three factors. One, the education system. I already talked about that at length. The way in which the education system is prefabricating religious maniacs to, to dominate society. Okay. Two, the difference in birth rate, right? The crazy religious right wing people have a lot of children. The more liberal, more modern, more atheistic, more secular, more, more progressive people. I know progressive is a low term, but the, the people who are not religious maniacs, right? I, I, frankly, left, right, or center. They have dramatically fewer children. Many of them have no children at all, right? Like, let me put it this way when it comes to Israel. The people who are connected to reality have few children. The people who are disconnected from reality, the true believers, the people who are living in a dream, they have a lot of children. Again, this didn't just start yesterday. This has been going on for decades. So obviously, this is reciprocal with the education problem. These people have a lot of children. They put their children into crazy religious fundamentalist schools. The outcomes are great. Okay. But point three is look at the relocation of the millionaire class. That really matters. Now, I'm not saying you can just look at the number of multimillionaires from Israel who actually give up their Israeli passport and start using an American passport, right? It's very difficult to do. A lot of these people, like they, they still have an Israeli passport, but whether they choose to live in the United States of America or Berlin or Paris or the Caribbean or Thailand or Japan, a lot of the multimillionaire class of Israel is just going to check out. They are just going to leave. They are no longer going to be part of that democratic process, that democratic struggle. And who is going to remain? Right. So my point is here, like for one thing, a lot of poor people don't really have the ability to leave Israel. They don't have the choice, but some of them will leave too. There are poor and middle class people in Israel who are atheists or who are left wing or have a more modern, moderate outlook. They are uncomfortable in Israel. Plenty of them leave. Uh, we had someone in the audience saying that he he's met those people working in kitchens. I assume that was in New York City. Israelis who've left and gone to New York. Um I met uh, two Israeli guys who ran away from Israel, um, started a bakery in Taiwan. So a Jewish bakery in Taiwan run by two Israeli guys who are getting the fuck out of Israel. I, I, I don't think they were multimillionaires. They saved up enough money to open a bakery in Israel and get the hell out, sorry, in Taiwan and get the hell out of Israel. You know, yeah, there are some poor people. There are some middle-class people who do that, okay? But whether or not you regard this as tragic, Poor people don't have very much power and influence in a parliamentary democracy, in a British-style semi-democracy. In the British tradition of parliamentary democracy, it's the multi-millionaire class who really matter, who really have influence. And disproportionately, it is the left and the center, the modern, secular multi-millionaires who are leaving Israel who are disengaging from that political process, who are giving up. So again, that's going to exacerbate this shift to the religious right within Israel. Okay. So we come back to the title of this video. And as I'm clarifying, this would be too short and too boring a video if I just told you what my answer is. If people ask me, are you a Zionist or are you an anti-Zionist? I'm telling you how you should answer this question. You and you and you, whoever the fuck you are, in the audience, all right? The first example I went through was the Golan Heights, all right? What is the Golan Heights? Who are the Golanese? Who are the people of the Golan Heights? And you have to be willing to move beyond this ready-made, prefabricated notion of Palestinians. 
It's deeply incoherent. It's intentionally misleading. And it's ultimately nonsensical. All right. The people of the Golan Heights were citizens of Syria who ended up being conquered by Israel. All right. In a tradition that was very much ossified in the Napoleonic period, a tradition that was set in stone, standardized in the Napoleonic period, right? We have this assumption that nations make war with one another and then they sit down to write a treaty. And when it comes time to write that treaty, both sides want to have something to trade, right? So when Israel gets to that very Napoleonic treaty writing process, because it hasn't changed, hasn't changed since Napoleon, they say to Syria, okay, you invaded us in retaliation. Our army moved forward and captured this small piece of land called the Golan Heights. <laughs> They've been holding it now for decades and decades. Now, if you would like to sign a treaty with us where we normalize the border, we establish the, for the formal relationship between the two countries, so on and so forth, you have a peace treaty that establishes peace and trade between these two countries, ends the war. If you would like us to give you back this land that under international law is Israel's. It like, just say, legally, that is Israeli territory. And if you don't like it, like if you don't like this tradition, I'm not saying like the fucking Napoleonic, the, 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 it's not even Napoleon's fault, but the tradition of how international relations works, of how political science works, of how borders are defined, how treaties are written, this tradition that really became normalized in the Napoleonic period, which, by the way, is the same period when uh, the American Revolution comes to its end and the United States of America starts to enter into its international relations with all of its neighbors, not just the indigenous people, but the Spanish Empire, the French Empire, the British Empire, right? So it's it's not a coincidence. This is also the period in which these, these European empires are spanning the whole globe, right? So you get different European countries disputing who controls what territory in Africa, in Asia, in South America, North America, right? So there's a reason why it's in this period that these things really become normalized. It was a very clear-cut process. But I'm not saying this is like morally good or perfect. It's just the result of a centuries-long um, cultural development of these, of these norms and assumptions. Okay, so again, legally, the Golan Heights is Israeli territory. Okay, the citizens who have been living in the Golan Heights, nobody wants to use this word, right? They are captives of Israel. They were conquered, they were captured, right, in that war. And again, legally, this is the system we have. What matters very much is that Israel was not the aggressor, was that Syria invaded Israel first, and then Israel retaliated by advancing and taking this land. Under, again, whether you like it or not, that is our system. And that's why still to this day, uh, North Korea and communist China will not admit whether it was North Korea that first invaded South Korea or South Korea that first invaded North Korea. Because legally, that matters. Like who is occupying who? Who is the aggressor? That really matters. And uh, nobody seems to care about this. But Russia, in its wars with Ukraine, even before, uh, let's say before 2020, you know, back 2015 and, and all this, all these little conflicts that led up to the current uh, war, Russia was always very careful to create some kind of pretext so that they could claim in a court of law that they were not the aggressor, that they didn't invade first. Uh, I've never seen mainstream news talking about that. But normally when you get into it, the Russians have a list of dates on a calendar, like, oh, on this date, there was uh, this explosion here. They normally have some. Uh, you know, they have a case they can present in court that when Russia invaded the Donbass or when Russia invaded Crimea or something, that there really was causus belli, that they were reacting to some kind of aggression from the Ukrainian side. Now, obviously, I'm not saying this is true, but my point is uh, this is a legal doctrine and a cultural tradition that can be manipulated, right? Um, you know. Anyway, we get into all kinds of funny examples of when the, when countries were and were not able to. Um, oh, sorry, the original the phrase we have in English, the Manchurian incident, and so on. You know, different uh, situations where there was some attempt to make it appear that the other side was invading when in that one side was invading when actually the other side was invading. 
this kind of thing goes on for this reason. Okay. So um, I know people are very passionate about this. They're very angry about this. They very readily resort to violence about this. Okay. When you look at the map of Israel, once you understand this about the Golan Heights, once you have admitted to yourself the nature of what the Golan Heights is and who the people are that are living there, right? Very rapidly, you're going to realize it is the same story over again with the two other territories that are referred to somewhat misleadingly as Palestine. Okay. I've been through this several times with people left, right, and center where I ask them very simply, why do you think the West Bank is called the West Bank? What is it the West Bank of? And very often, their first reaction is Palestine, that it's the West Bank of Palestine. No, no, that doesn't make sense. If your claim is that like this shape on the map is Palestine, then it would be the Eastern zone it wouldn't be called the Eastern Bank, but it would be the easternmost region of Palestine, right? That would be east of Palestine, the east corner. Why is it called the West Bank? Because it was the West Bank of Jordan. In exactly the same way that the Golan Heights used to be Syria, and the people who lived there were Syrian, the West Bank was part of Jordan. And the people who lived there were Jordanian. They were citizens of Jordan. And Jordan had a parliament. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you it was a perfect democracy, but they had a parliamentary system, very much in direct imitation of England, the British system of parliament, right? And they had elections in the West Bank where people from the West Bank were part of the same government, the same parliamentary system that represented the rest of Jordan, right? Here's where it's different. The big difference is the king of Jordan actually wanted to get rid of the West Bank and was happy to have the Israelis take it over. Now, there's kind of a long story as to why that is, but one of the crucial elements is that the, the, the Palestinian terrorists of that time within Jordan, they'd had a period of actively attempting to assassinate the king of Jordan and other members of the royal family. So there was a power struggle within Jordan that was very bitter, and it led the king of Jordan and, and the royal family and elite around him, a certain powerful minority within Jordanian society, to come to the conclusion that it was in their interest to embrace the Israeli occupation of the West Bank of Jordan, rather than to continue to try to pacify it themselves, to try to use their own army to go in and, and massacre Palestinian terrorists and exert the royal family's control over it and to snuff out this, this movement, right? Now, you may say that I'm simplifying the situation. I think that is an adequate description of the politics. I really do. Uh, again, you can know enough about these things. You don't have to devote your life to it and become a become an expert in it. Um, you know, having heard this, this is one of those things, once it's seen, it can't be unseen. If you know people who are pro-Palestinian, left, right, or center, most likely you're talking about left-wing people, if you're talking about white people, but if you're talking about people who were born... Uh, born into a Muslim family, whether they be Arabic, Middle East, wh whatever their background is. But many of them are right-wing. Many of them are conservative Muslims. They're, they're true-believing right-wing Muslims. But they also are pro-Palestinian. So you can meet people of all different political persuasions who are pro-Palestinian. You will notice that they very often bitterly hate the royal family of Jordan. They will often say to you that they hate all of these leaders in the region, including the leaders of Egypt, whom they consider to be anti-Palestinian. And often what they'll say about it is very incoherent and confusing. But what I've just told you is a very clear puzzle piece. All right. So that's that's all I'm saying with this. You have, a, in some ways, the situation with the West Bank is exactly the same as the Golan Heights. 
the difference is that Syria does want to eventually have the Golan Heights return to Syria. Um, the attitude of the ruling elite in Jordan is that they don't want the West Bank back. Now, that could change. And also, I think if you actually polled normal people, like middle-class people and poor people in Jordan, you say, look, do you guys want the West Bank to be returned to Jordan? I, I'm, I'm assuming some percentage of people say, yeah, that used to be part of our country. And those people who live there are basically Jordanians. And it doesn't seem to make much sense for them to be under Israeli military occupation. It is possible that, uh, you know, the broad population, that people would like it to be returned to Jordan. But the people at the elite level, um, they remember the bitterness of the struggle at that time. And they were happy to have the border redrawn with Israel and to have peace and cooperation with Israel. And basically to be in cooperation with Israel against the Palestinians. And I'm putting it in quotation marks because exactly what you have to question is the ready-made identity of what it is to be a Palestinian. And we get three different answers, right? One for the West Bank, one for the Golan Heights, uh, one for the uh, for the Gaza Strip. Now, I just give my prediction. I would assume decade by decade, the attitudes within Jordan will change in this way because it is a very strange arrangement that the royal family of Jordan struck with Israel. But which way they will change, I don't know. Um, so then finally, you come to the, the Gaza Strip and it is exactly the same deal, except uh, the Egyptians are even more hostile towards the Gaza Strippers, so to speak, right? Um, the border in this case, Israel at one point massively expanded its border. They conquered a lot of territory going further south into Egypt. And then Egypt fought a war to recapture the territory and push it back. And when the Egyptians negotiated the line and drew the line for the new border with Israel, which is meaning the border they still have today, um, the attitude of the Egyptians at that time toward the Palestinians, again, you have to question what does Palestinian mean? The Palestinians who were there in the Gaza Strip was incredibly negative and incredibly hostile. Like it was not the case that the Egyptians had the attitude of these are our people, these are our brothers, we want them to return to us and so they should come here and live in, his, in Egypt. Um, it's remarkable when you look at the border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt, how much the Egyptian government and how much in general the Egyptian population really despises the Palestinians in that area. And again, you, when you talk to people who are pro-Palestinian, you know, especially if they're actually Muslims and they're actually from the region, it, this may be confusing to you. It's like, well, wait, I, you know, you listen and like, okay, I understand why you hate Israel, but why do you like hate Egypt even more than you hate Israel? Like, you know. And they will tell you some really crazy things. Like, you know, well, I mean, the particular person may tell you things that are factually true, or they may tell you things that are false. But very often, these guys will run into a whole bunch of crazy kind of conspiracy theory stuff where they're ranting on and on about how their real enemy is like the government of Egypt, because the government of Egypt is like more Zionist than the government of Israel and this kind of stuff. You know, whether it's the government of Egypt or the West Bank, in general, the pro Palestinian people feel betrayed by these governments, you know, in the region. And the just say this, the attitude of the Egyptian government is that the Palestinian terrorists within the Gaza Strip are a problem to be contained. Um, I would say that the elite in Jordan and even the elite in relatively remote places like Dubai, like a lot of the elite wealthy people uh, in the Muslim countries surrounding Israel or throughout the whole region, whether those countries are democratic or are totally anti-democratic, whether they're a dictatorship or ruled by a royal family, the elite, the wealthy people, the vast majority of them, left, right, or center, they regard the Palestinian terrorists as a problem to be contained. They don't feel, you know, like a real sense of love and positivity towards the inhabitants of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. Uh, this and again, if you actually talk to the pro-Palestinian people, they will often viciously complain this way. And it's if you're new to the politics, you're like, what? Like you might be wondering, why don't you feel very positively about these rich people, rich Muslims, who are donating all this money that improves the quality of life, like in the Gaza Strip and, and the West Bank? Why do you hate and resent exactly the millionaire donor class your own situation seems to rely on? 
And then normally, again, if you ask, they'll start telling you. And what they're telling you may sound like a bunch of really crazy conspiracy theories or the particular person. It may sound plausible and you can kind of figure out what the hell is what the hell is going on. All right. OK, so like, <laughs> um, if people ask you, are you a Zionist or are you an anti-Zionist? You know, the real answer is neither nor. You know, the real answer is that as a nihilist, you have to move beyond the ready-made prepackaged meaning of the word Palestinian. And certainly you have to move past the ready-made prepackaged meaning of Israel of Zion. What you should tell people is this. In as much as the word Israel represents secular democracy. To that extent, I support Israel only because I support secular democracy. In as much as Israel, in fact, represents a theocracy. It represents a religious state that is, so to speak, the Jewish equivalent of Saudi Arabia then I don't support that at all, right? And we are now drifting into a period. And say my prediction is it's going to be very durable. It's going to be long-term in which Israel really is the Jewish equivalent of Saudi Arabia, in which Israel's claims to being a modern Western secular democracy, a place where atheist intellectuals can flourish, is going from wafer thin to paper thin. We're heading into what I've repeatedly called here the darkest period of Israeli-Palestine relations in the history of the world. Every monotheistic religion is an apocalyptic death cult. There is a tradition in Theravada Buddhism. This is the Orthodox school of Buddhism. There is a tradition that the world will end and it's always expressed in terms of hundreds of millions of years. And you can imagine some people try to interpret this like geologically. There are some poetic statements that like this world is going to last such a long time that the rain falling on the highest mountains will wear those mountains down until they're flat, and that other places of the world that are flat, new mountains will be pushed up. You know, like the world lasts for such a long time that there are huge boulders that crumble into tiny pebbles. There is this imagery. Um, within Theravada Buddhism, the sense of the enormity and the ancientness of the world is emphasized. These people didn't know about dinosaurs or anything like that. But they say things like, you know, the ocean is so vast, you know, there are sharks, but then there are whales that are big enough to eat the sharks. And then there are whale eaters. There are whales so big that they eat the smaller whales. And then there are whale eater eaters. There are these even more enormous whales that dwarf the other whales. You know, again, none of this is based on a real scientific understanding. They don't understand geology. They don't understand evolution or biology or, or anything else. But this was an ancient culture in India, and that was their perspective on the world. The world had gone on for millions of years, and it would continue to go on for millions of years. But nevertheless, they did also preach that there's a kind of apocalypse that will eventually come. And everyone in the religion is trying to delay that apocalypse. They want this world to last as long as possible even though their perspective is that it goes on for millions of years, right? You have to understand the core of the Jewish religion, the core of the Christian religion, the core of the Muslim religion, and the definitive agony of the conservative living in the 21st century is that these are people who want the world to end. They read in the Bible that God 
wiped out all mankind in a flood once before. And then God created the rainbow as a symbol of his promise to mankind that he would never do this again. There is no explanation in the Bible for why God broke his word, why God changed his mind. Um, he made the promise after the flood that he would never again do this, wiping out all the people of the world. And the symbol of his promise is the rainbow. These are people who completely ignore that part of the scripture and fasten on and focus on what's properly speaking the heretical doctrine that God is precisely going to do again what he promised and pledged he would never do, that God is going to break his own covenant, his own commandment. They're so eager for the next deluge, for the next flood, for the next mass genocide. These are people who hate this life. They're people who hate this world. They're people who hate themselves. And they inculcate this world-hating, self-hating attitude into the next generation through organized education, through organized religion. All right. I realize a tiny percentage of people become suicide bombers. Right. It's insignificant. But the number of people who are looking forward to Judgment Day, the number of people who look down on this world as not worth saving and this life as not worth living, it is not measured in the millions. It's measured in the billions at this point. That is the basis for the utter hopelessness of this new era of Israeli politics. And you must look seriously at education in the United States, at education in England, education in Scotland, Germany, Switzerland, Brazil, wherever you may be watching this video, you have to look at education in your own country and ask yourself, how close are you going to come in the next 30 years to precisely this same problem? that dooms the democracy of Israel.